From its deep lakes to its verdant mountain tops, Auvergne in central France presents an infinite variety of landscapes. This includes a unique concentration of ancient volcanoes. With its rich cultural heritage, it's also a grass-rooted region that caters to food lovers, making the most of its treasures. It is part of a greater region called Massif Central and is renowned for its stock breeding, despite hard winters, as well as its rich and preserved wilderness. Proud of its rich medieval history, Auvergne maintains its ancestral rural traditions while at the same time optimistically embracing the future. Dormant volcanoes cover a large part of Auvergne, whose two main areas are Cantal and Puy de Dôme. Our journey begins at the Plan du Cantal summit, the highest peak in the Cantal region. In winter, the valley of the Serre River is often covered in snow. The Serre is 20 kilometers long and takes its source in the Plan du Cantal massif. At an altitude of a thousand meters, Saint-Jacques-des-Blas is the last village on the road before reaching the summit. It's a stage on one of the pilgrimage routes to Santiago de Compostela. At the end of the Second World War, this peaceful village was the scene of a bitter battle between the German army and French resistance forces. Up until the 17th century, traveling there was a daunting prospect. It was difficult to get to because of its harsh climate and the land was inhabited by bears and wolves. The entire region seemed inhospitable and unsuited to any form of human occupation. In the 19th century, large-scale development works made it accessible and tourism soared. The Cantal Mountains are the base of a single and unique volcano that was about 70 kilometers long. Several mountain villages are scattered in the area and seem frozen in time. Jacques Lemarie runs a goat farm here with a herd of 50 animals. We're at the foot of the Puy-Marie peak, at an altitude of about a thousand meters. We're in the mountains here, so we have to accept its limitations. When there's a lot of snow, we don't often take the goats out. But when there's no snow, they go out every day, nearly every day. These goats are a massive central breed. There's an association in Saint-Franc in the Haute-Loire that revived the breed in the 1990s. They're cheese goats. They don't give a lot of milk, but it makes good cheese. A few kilometers from the village, a pass leads to the Puy-Marie peak. It's a vestige of the highest stratovolcano in Europe, culminating at 1,783 meters. West of the Puy-Marie, we cross an area of former peat bogs. This protected area is part of the natural park of the Auvergne volcanoes. The Lac de Pêche is a former peat bog. It takes its name from the many species of fish that live in it. But it's also home to endemic plant species and attracts a wide variety of birds.
we continue our route north to meet Jean-Paul Cornet, who, even in winter, raises hardy Percheron draft horses here. We're in Saint-Saturnin, at an altitude of 1250 meters. This is the plateau of Limon. As you can see, winters are harsh here. I think the horses have got used to it. At the moment, they're a little bit skinny because it's winter. And these horses usually weigh eight to 900 kilos. And in summer, when they're well fed and in good form, they can weigh a ton or more. They spend two or three nights at minus 16. They don't mind the cold, but they can't stand the wet. The worst thing is when it rains, especially if the rain's cold, or if it's half rain and half snow. But they don't mind the cold. Even at minus 16, they don't suffer. They have thick coats. Look, it's very thick. It protects them from the cold. Also in the heights sits the village of La Godivelle at an altitude of 1,200 meters. With its 15 inhabitants, it's the last inhabited place in this immensity of bogs and forests. Its church dates from the 11th century. On the square, there's a remarkable round water fountain that's large enough for a few salaire cows to gather round to drink from. The village has two lakes. The lower lake is the result of a peat bog. The upper lake is a 44 meter deep volcanic crater. Both lakes are protected. A little further west, Moriac is one of the oldest towns in the area. It can be traced to the first century. Moriac is famous for its cattle auction. It's computerized and animals from the entire region are sold. Breeders can sell them by lots or individually. Buyers view the animal's descriptions on a screen and get additional information from the auctioneer over a microphone. It's a rising bid auction, and the breeders sell their cattle anonymously. Several buyers bid on the animals. So, there is a fair balance between supply and demand. There's quite a lot of information on the screen. You have the animal's weight, its date of birth, its breed, its state of health. So, if the lot is well balanced, then the buyer will be able to assess the animals and buy according to his needs. The auction takes place every Monday morning. Currently, calves are the most sought after. That's to say, males and females less than one year old. Buried deep in the snow, the village of Trizac might look uninhabited, but this is not so. Even if, like almost everywhere in this region, there are more animals here than people. The village boasts a renowned butcher shop. The owner, Patrick Born, is an ardent supporter of the Salaire breed. His meat is much sought after by connoisseurs. This is really an emblematic region for Salaire's cattle. We're in the mountains here, and they graze all summer from May to October. And what's more, salers is a marbled meat that has texture. You have to expect it to be firmer, but its flavor is simply exceptional. The first thing to consider is the quality of its fat. It's good white fat like this, not at all yellow. These animals haven't been fed silage. They've had nothing but good dry hay. It's magnificent. And the grain you see in this meat, that's salers. The marbling, all the veins, these little vessels that are whitish are what characterize Salers. It's excellent. For me, as a professional, it's simply the best. Mm -hmm. 
back to the Puy Marie, which rises to 1783 meters. A favorite of cyclists, the nearby Pas de Perol is the highest road pass in the Massif Central and offers a grandiose panorama. It leads to the village of Salaire. Perched at an altitude of 950 meters, Salaire is over a thousand years old. In the 16th century, this rich merchant town became an important judicial and administrative center. Attracting both the nobility and the upper middle class, the town was embellished with Renaissance-style buildings. In Auvergne, the views on the valleys are often spectacular. Here, burons are part of the landscape. These small stone houses used to have two functions. They provided shelter for the cowherds during the summer season from May to October, and they were used to store the newly made cheeses. These small buildings are low and squat, covered in slate tiles. They're partially buried in the ground to protect the inhabitants from strong winds and snow. We travel down to Tournemir, where the 15th century castle is surely one of the most splendid medieval forts in the region. It's been inhabited by the same family since its construction. My family built this chateau and lived in it through the centuries. And we're still here. I must be the 23rd generation of the family to live here. The castle houses a collection of period furniture, old tapestries, and precious frescoes, such as the Legend of the Nine Valiants, depicting famous 16th century heroes. The arms room is on the third floor and contains a monumental 17th century tapestry. There are many mountain fortresses like this, little mountain chateaus, they're called. They were places where royal authority was maintained, especially against the English who weren't very far away. The Dordogne Valley separated us from them, and that's not very far from here. Climbing again, we head towards the Neron Pass to meet Guy and Marie-Jo Chambon at an altitude of 1,300 meters. They are producers of Salaire AOP tradition and are the last traditional Buron farmers of the area. It's a different thing altogether. The cows are much more relaxed living like this, and so are we for that matter. Here, the well-being of the animals is respected. Guy and Marie-Jo live to the natural rhythm of their cattle. Salaire cows are special. They refuse to be milked if their calves are not near them. So Guy and Marie-Jo are careful not to separate the sucklings from their mothers. This is a far cry from the modern milk industry that uses non-local breeds to produce the regional milk. These are mountain pastures here. The cows eat licorice and gentian, and this gives a milk with a distinctive taste and color. This is reflected in the cheese's rind. The milk is collected and poured into a wooden container called a gel. This is transported a short distance to the traditional family cheesemaking building. Everything's easy here. Once the cows have been milked, they're free to wander where they please. The milk's brought back here where it's worked, matured here in our cellar. Everything's done right here. They work from morning till night. Between milking and making cheese, they get very little rest. There aren't many young people today ready to take over Guy's work. He'll be retiring soon, and when he goes, so will the local traditionally made mountain salaire cheese. After maturation, the cheese is ground, mixed with salt, and left to rest overnight. Then Guy prepares to press it. You have to let the cheese mature properly. It contains gas. And after a certain stage, the gas is no longer effective. It must work. The cheese is veined. And if you take it directly from the press, it's not properly formed, and it breaks into pieces. The gas has to come out at some time or another.
After a day in the press, the cheese is taken to the cellar. It remains there for 15 to 21 days before being sent to a cheese refiner for several months. A long-lasting process to make this inimitable Salaire tradition cheese. Lower down the valley is Murat, an important crossroads. The town is protected by an eight-metre-tall statue of the Virgin and Child, standing on a huge rock. A city with a rich medieval past, Murat boasts numerous classified buildings. In the centre of the old town stands the collegiate church of Notre-Dame-des-Oliviers. Ravaged by fire in 1493, it was entirely rebuilt and enlarged over the centuries. At 1,855 meters altitude, the Plan du Cantal is the highest point in the Cantal Mountains. In winter, you can ski down the other side to the resort of Le Lioran. Cantal is a land of lakes and waterfalls. This one makes a spectacular descent from a height of over 40 meters. Its water comes from a river that flows over a basalt cliff. Above the valleys stands a shepherd's chapel that is today no more than a ruin, open to the four winds. But for more than a century, it was a gathering place for the mountain herdsmen. It was here that the local cowherds and shepherds could attend Sunday Mass. Wild gentian can be found in profusion in the area. Drissi Marbou has been picking them for more than 10 years. This work requires a lot of strength and a good knowledge of the plant. You need a good eye to spot plants that are over 30 years old and to select the roots that are good for distillation. This is wild gentian. It's nature's gift to us. Maceration distills the aromas of the gentian. And from this distillation, we make an aperitif that has been consumed in the Cantal for years and years. The twin-pronged tool is called a devil's fork. It weighs between 10 and 20 kilos, depending on the model. Oh, I can spot them easily. They grow in clumps. The roots get all stuck together, and it makes big clumps afterwards. This one's 40 years old. At least 40 years old. You have to dig up the whole thing. You mustn't break it. You have to aim for it. You go around it and pull it up whole. If you don't, then half the plant will stay in the ground. It's a question of strength and technique. This gentian plant here is at least 30 years old. We use the root to make gentian liqueur. It's the root we want. You see this big plant here? Its root is 30 years old. It's important to use large roots. There's a lot of flesh on them. And the flesh is what produces a fine bitterness in the gentian. So when you taste it, you have a very elegant note of licorice and an incredible bitterness that allows us to make a good liqueur. Some valleys are more isolated than others, especially in winter. 
This hamlet is home to the Roucher family's farm. They specialize in Aubrac cattle, an increasingly popular breed. These buildings were built to withstand winter snow. They have very thick walls, walls that are one meter fifty thick, walls that keep the heat inside. A building like this, full of animals, even when it's minus 15 or minus 20 outside, it retains a temperature of about 10 degrees. Claude Roucher keeps a close eye on the newborns. Two days. He's 24 hours, well, 48 hours old. Ready. Ready. Aubrac cattle are a rustic breed. They're native to this region, and they've existed for many years. They almost disappeared in the 1960s over a question of productivity. But thanks to the commitment of some stock breeders, the breed was saved. And today, it's the fastest expanding breed in France. We call it an accordion breed, especially the Aubrac, which is smaller and stockier than the Salaire. It needs less fodder, it can support drought, it can even withstand a temporary lack of fodder. That's the criteria. But they are, in fact, two nearly identical breeds. My great-grandfather bought this farm, so great-grandfather, grandfather, father, that makes me the fourth generation. My son will be the fifth generation, and the farm's still in the same family. On our way back to the Plan du Cantal, there's a nice surprise in store for us. This abandoned farmhouse has been entirely restored and transformed into a guest house. This building dates from 1834, so it's mid-19th century, about. This room is typically Auvergnian in style. It has a large fireplace with small chest-like benches on either side that contained supplies of salt. And we have the old kitchen with shelves of volcanic stone. Here everything's made of volcanic stone, the floor, the walls, and inside it's all wooden partitioning. In the old days, there was an enormous amount of snow here in winter, and as people couldn't get to the village on the other side of the mountain, they had their own chapel, their own school, they lived in complete independence. Aurillac is at the foot of the Cantal Mountains. Although traces of Gallic occupation have been found near the town, it only became important in the 10th century as the birthplace of Gerbert of Aurillac, the first French pope under the name of Sylvester II. His papacy only lasted four years, but his influence was notable. Aurillac is also a paradise for cheese lovers. The star product is, of course, Salaire tradition. René Magnaval owns a huge maturing cellar. Here, a whole room is reserved exclusively for producers who respect the norms of traditional cheesemaking. After resting a short time in the producer's cellar, the rounds are sent here for about a year's maturation. Salaire Tradition has the label Tradition. It takes at least six months to a year for the cheese to mature. And as much as a year to a year and a half when it's properly done. You see, when you have pastes, you see, that's a typical Salaire paste. 
It must have the correct texture, the maillé as we call it. The cheeses must be regularly turned over and salted. Sorting's done by hand, so we have to remember to turn them over. We turn them over at least once a week and we rub them and that's what gives them a grainy surface afterwards. We're on our way north towards the highest peaks in the Massif Central. Lake Pava is one of the most emblematic places in the region. It's the deepest lake in Auvergne and the most mysterious. Lac Pava is a meromictic lake, the only such lake in mainland France, characterized by having two superimposed lakes, one on top of the other. The top lake, from 0 to 60 meters, functions as a normal lake. The bottom lake, from 60 to 92, is anoxic and deficient in oxygen. Meromictic lakes, like Lac Pavin, have been studied carefully since the 1990s. In 1986, Lake Nias in the Cameroon overturned and degassed, and all the people in the nearby valley died. Since then, an inventory of all such lakes has been undertaken. Every year they're checked to see if the buffer zone between the upper lake and the lower lake is stable or if there are any risks. The village of Bess is near the lake. A communal charter established in the 13th century has resulted in architectural unity. The town was built on a lava flow that also served as a quarry, the stone from which was used in most of the town's buildings. The 13th century Romanesque church is the oldest surviving building. Every 2nd of July, the Black Madonna is carried in a procession from the church to a chapel about eight kilometers away. During the Middle Ages, fortifications were built around the town to protect it, as well as to affirm its commercial importance. French Queen Catherine de Medici inherited this land in the 16th century. Several squares were developed in this mercantile town. There, all sorts of its products were sold, including the famous Saint-Nectaire cheese. In winter, it can be difficult to reach the mountainous zone, such as this hamlet where Nathalie and Philippe Grandpère have their farm. Outside, a cold wind blows and the thermometer falls below freezing. But inside the stable, life follows its daily course. Here, farmstead saint cheese is made. Philippe has taken over the family farm. At 1,200 meters altitude, in the middle of winter, it's not always easy. Morning milking has just begun. Philippe raises different breeds of cattle. Each breed is chosen for its particular qualities. Montbéliard for their meat and dairy production. And by crossbreeding them with Holsteins, we can get more milk while still retaining the meat quality of the Montbéliard. There's no specific breed for saint All breeds are good, so long as they're properly fed and cared for. The milk is sent immediately to the other end of the stable where Nathalie receives it in a perfectly self-contained processing unit. There, I'm adding the rennet. I'm going to let the milk curdle. The liquid milk must solidify.
The milk must be processed immediately, and we milk twice a day. So if we process all the milk into cheese, then we have to make it twice a day, both in the morning and the evening. They're dried between two and eight days. Then they're aged in the cellar. A large saint nectaire requires 13 liters of milk. I prefer them aged. Not too, too much, but they should have a little character. Slight taste of hazelnut and a nice, soft, creamy texture. It's important to eat them at room temperature. In winter, Natalie's main problem is being able to deliver her cheeses regardless of the weather conditions. The Puy de Sancy at 1886 meters altitude is the highest point in Auvergne, as well as the highest volcano in mainland France. It's accessible through Mont d'Or. The town is both a ski resort and a thermal spa. The springs were known to the Romans, but it was during the 1890s, in the period known as the Belle Epoque, that the town became famous. The architectural style of many of the buildings is testimony to these times. Nearby, the Chaux de Four Valley is both a national nature reserve and a spectacular site. There are many streams and waterfalls. There are five springs. The most well known is the Saint Anne Spring, rich in iron. The Chaux de Four Valley was formed about 600,000 years ago from volcanic activity. This glacial cirque formation, and in fact the whole valley, are exceptional sites. There are many characteristic rock formations. Some are dagger-shaped, others are the upper portions of ancient lava flows. This chaos created strange magmatic formations popular today with seasoned climbers. The flora is also remarkable and well diversified. More than 1,600 species have been recorded. Many are in a good state of conservation. The fauna is also doing well. There are more than 600 species listed, including mouflons and the mysterious Apollo butterflies that are endemic to the valley. Not far from Chaux de Four, perched at a thousand meters altitude on a volcanic outcrop, the Chateau de Mourol does not go unnoticed. Built in the 11th century, it controlled the access to the highlands. During the Middle Ages, function took precedence over comfort and the living quarters were primitive. Guillaume de Merol was the symbolic lord of Merol. He lived in the 15th century and he reached the age of 90. Located in a fertile, prosperous and populated region at an important crossroads, Murol was a rich agro-pastoral centre. The Chateau de Murol is really very interesting. Since the beginning of its history in the 11th century, it was never captured, thanks to its very modern defence system. Even extinct volcanoes are awe-inspiring. At 1,629 meters altitude, the panorama from the top of the Puy de la Tache is simply breathtaking. The lakes add a bluish touch and contrast with the predominance of green. The Lac de Guéry, greatly appreciated by fishermen, is the highest in Auvergne. These rocks are vestiges of former volcanoes. Nearby, the Notre Dame d'Orcival Basilica is one of the most beautiful Romanesque churches in Auvergne. 
This colossal shrine, constructed at the end of the 12th century, was built of dark volcanic stone and has a flagstone roof. It contains a remarkable statue of the Virgin and Child, carved in walnut and covered with silver leaf and vermeil. According to tradition, it's said to have been sculpted by St. Luke the Evangelist. Some of the volcanoes appear to be in better trim than others. And this is thanks to the flocks of sheep that have been brought in. During the summer season, the sheep eat the tall grasses and help to preserve the biodiversity. Here we have a flock of about 80 ewes, the Ravak sheep. It's the rustic breed of the region. They graze on the slopes and volcanoes in the natural park of the Auvergne volcanoes, on small sites that are fragile, particularly where the biodiversity is at risk. For Esteban, a shepherd, it's a new role that will put him in contact with tourists. We always imagine shepherds as loners, solitary, rather distant individuals. But here there's a lot of people. There's a certain amount of teaching and human contact that has to be accepted and shared. It's a rather different job on the summer pastures, and it's longer too. Auvergne played a central role in French history during the Roman period, notably in 52 BC, when Gallic leader Vercingetorix heroically confronted Julius Caesar. Not much remains on the plateau de Gergovi to remind us of the conflict that opposed them. Historically, Gergovi is truly an exceptional site. Obviously, for its history. It was here that the legendary battle took place in 52 BC between two historical personages, Julius Caesar and Vercingetorix, a battle which left a few archaeological traces. This is all that remains of the fortifications. The rest must be left to your imagination. Why did they choose this plateau, dominating the surrounding area, looking out over the landscape so characteristic of Auvergne today? There are no solid definitive answers. There was an obvious defensive element in the plateau which was protected by rather steep slopes. But we can imagine that the Gauls, the Averni, chose this site for its landscape and its exceptional panorama. At the foot of this plateau are Clermont and Montferrand. These two former rival cities were united in the 17th century under the name of Clermont-Ferrand. The most symbolic volcano of the region is only about 15 kilometers from the town. The Puy de Dôme was formed about 11,000 years ago and rises to 1,465 meters. In the second century, it was the site of one of the largest mountain sanctuaries, the Temple of Mercury. The Chêne des Puits is a range of 80 dormant volcanoes, which is now inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage Site list. In the valley below, Clermont-Ferrand can be seen from afar, thanks to the two towering black spires that top its cathedral. This church was built entirely in black lava from Volvic, a local volcanic stone. The Gothic cathedral, begun in 1248, was erected on a hillock which is now in the center of the old town. By the year 1000, the city of Clermont was already an important ecclesiastic center. It was here, during a synod in 1095, that Pope Urban II launched his call for the First Crusade. The power of the bishops declined in the 16th century when Catherine de' Medici became the Dame de Clermont. Clermont then became a royal town. The decisive impetus of the town's development came in the 19th century when the Michelin rubber factory was founded. Today, the company is still one of the world's largest tire manufacturers. A remarkable view of the Puy de Dôme can be seen from the cathedral. (laughs) 
North of Clermont-Ferrand are the garden and atelier of Nicole Guillain, a painter and lava enamelist. In an old mill, she has a workshop and four permanent exhibition rooms. I work mainly with lava from Volvic. It comes from the volcanoes near the Col de la Nugère, near Volvic. This lava is well known for its enameling qualities. The colors of the enameling are only revealed after firing. The pre-bake colors are totally different from the colors that come out of the kiln. I particularly love to paint snow, snow and trees. That's felt tip pen, but you could use pencil. It contains graphite, and that acts as a barrier that retains the enamel. But you can do a whole design in cloisonné. Cloisonné is used to separate the enamels and to keep the contours. Nicole also expresses her talent on much larger pieces. A little to the west of Volvic, the Chateau de Tournoel dominates the plains. When Claude Agut bought the property, it was a mass of ruins. It required a great deal of perseverance to restore it. Built in the 10th century, the Chateau remained a military fortress for a long time. Claude Agut also undertook an immense task of archival research. Everything's classified like this. There are documents here from 1200, from 1300, 1400 on vellum. Incidentally, I made an inventory too. There, for example, is a land adjudication for a right of indemnity, for right of mortai, 21st of October 1498. And inside, I have the document on vellum. Look, it's really rather incredible. Everything had been securely hidden in 1760, long before the revolution. And I knew where it was. If you feel like seeing some more, I have more. <laughs> The decoration is still in progress. But the cabinet of curiosities is already very well stocked. There's still enough work to be done on the chateau to quench the owner's thirst and passion for restoration. The Puy de la Nugère may not be the most spectacular volcano in the Chêne des Puits, but it's the source of two well-known local products, Volvic mineral water and Volvic lava stone. As time went on, the interaction between the magma and the water resulted in phreatomagmatic eruptions, the creation of a lava lake. And then all these lava flows drained into the Volvic Valley towards the village of Volvic. There were multiple lava flows. The last occurred about 13,000 years ago. They resulted in the formation of the famous Volvic stone, tracheandesite. And it's through these different lava beds that all the water of the area flows before it finally arrives at the Volvic spring where it's captured as volvic mineral water.
About eight kilometers away, the Puy de Lantégy emerged from the Earth 30,000 years ago. Here we're at the center of the volcano, the very core of the Lamtegi volcano. We're 80 meters below the surface of the crater. We're actually inside a volcano. It was excavated by workmen. They made all these terraces and exposed the different strata of the volcano that we see. On the right, you have a volcanic chimney. This is the conduit from which the magma was vented during eruptions. Today it's a mass of solid rock. But during eruptions it was simply the conduit from which the magma was ejected. Propelled by the gases it flew into the air and produced scoria, and then falling back to the ground formed a volcanic ash called pozzolana. The extraction of pozzolana ceased in 2006. Today, the site is open to the public as a site of scientific discovery. We had a very important scientific heritage on our hands, and the future of this volcano was to preserve it, not to continue to exploit it and destroy all the discoveries that had been made. Towards the northwest, we reach a vast natural region of high granitic plateaus, hills and valleys. Perched on a cliff, the ruins of Chateau Rocher dominate the Sioule Valley. In Blois-l'Église, an artisanal mill processes one of the resources of the region, walnuts. The nuts are first ground on a stone mill. The oil mill has existed since 1857. I bought it in 1997. So that's, that's a few years ago. We use a millstone to crush the fruit. It produces a higher quality of oil than traditional grinders. The milled product is then heated over a wood fire. We heat the oil more than in other regions. In the past, the oil had to be kept all year long. It was a means of conserving it. But it also gives it flavor. If it's not heated, then there's no flavor. It's an old press. It's nearly a hundred years old. It's the last generation of mechanical presses. It's pure fruit juice. It's, it's real nectar. The Sioule River forms meanders that are worthy of the Amazon. Nearby, two young farmers have started to rear sheep. Lea and Hubert have just released about a hundred ewes into a field. Many of them has recently lambed. <laughs> Limousine sheep have a white robe. The wool is almost comparable to hair, like this. You don't see it very well on this lamb, but males tend to have a rather hooked nose, and they have a developed chest and a good posture. But it's basically a white breed that's similar to the Blanche du Massif and somewhat to the Lacone, but mostly to the Blanche du Massif. It's about uh, 15 to 20 kilos. It was born in early March, yeah. He's about 30 days old. Yes. He's done well.
The region around the gorge of La Sioule enjoys a microclimate that's beneficial to sheep farming. My grandfather used to say that it was the Riviera of the region. Yes, we're pretty well off here. It's a bit of a change. It acts as a weather barrier. Sometimes it rains more on the saint Gervais side than the Allier side. Two years ago, they started growing miniature vegetables, very much sought after by the renowned chefs of the region. It's best to cover them for the night. They still need this fleece. It's still cold at this time of year. Oh, it can get down to minus six. They can resist to minus one or two, but at minus six, they have to be covered. At the beginning of spring, the nursery is prospering. So we have eggplants, tomatoes. There are more tomatoes over there and a few flats of zucchinis and small leeks. The other side over there is for sales for clients in mid-May. It's tomatoes, eggplants and peppers. The couple started with organic eggs. With 900 hens, we could gather 700 to 800 eggs on a good day. The eggs are also supplied to the starred restaurants all around. A region of gastronomy, Auvergne continues to attract lovers of good food and of nature. A further reason to discover this fascinating and generous region. Feel so good in my skin.